I think the the conversation needs to be pivoted from why is is so complicated coming from them to why are physicians not making healthcare more personable to their patients? Um, and I think when when we begin to focus on the people involved, then we turn quality of care to not only being a measurable outcome of somebody's health, but also a measurable outcome of somebody's knowledge of their health care. Hey, y'all, this is Costa. And today I'm here with my guest, Hassan Abdella, CEO of Atla Healthcare Group. Today, we're talking about how to assess quality care from a compliance expert. Thank you for joining us, Hassan. Would you start by sharing a bit about your career in healthcare compliance and regulatory affairs, but also what does this mean to the everyday person? Well, Costa, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me on. Really excited to be here. Long time listener, first time caller, been wanting to say that for a while, so... I started out in healthcare just a little over a decade ago. I actually started off as a claims auditor for one of the big four, specifically in the healthcare space. Um, and so you'll hear me a little bit talk about that I've been on each side of the transaction. Um, so my journey began in as an auditor, um, so not very welcomed. Uh, and then I actually transitioned into a space that was probably less welcomed, which was as an SIU fraud investigator. Uh, this space... Um, really got a ton of experience um, in the managed care space around fraud, waste, and abuse, False Claims Act, doing uh, joint investigations with other health plans and payers, um, really living within the swamp of the CMS regulations. Um, and then I moved into leadership positions within compliance. Um, I kind of got on the, to the transactional side a little bit. Uh, I worked for a private entity where I overseen um, the compliance, but from a contracts and acquisition perspective, uh, so they were one of the few groups that got into private equity in the healthcare space early, very early on. Um, and then I became the chief compliance officer of Health Alliance Plan, which is one of the largest plans here in the state of Michigan. Um, it was a very interesting time because I was the youngest C-suite executive um, in the company at the time, which was challenging uh, because compliance is already a tough sell to the board and to, you know, when you're talking about things in terms of strategy. Um, and then I spent uh, uh, about a year and a half um, at a startup in New York um, where we were the first ever, we were building from the ground floor as a compliance officer. Um, and so what it means to the everyday individual, um, it's a niche space where our job is, we're not lawyering, we're not Ending or litigating, our job is to make sure that compliance is a living organism throughout the culture and processes of a company. And what that really means is, are there checks and balances through the job duties and, and the job responsibilities of every individual throughout the company that ultimately uphold regulatory laws and rules? Fascinating. And when I say that with literally all the endearment, because I work with compliance all of the time and we have this debate, essentially, um, you know, are we a company that focuses on compliance for our payers or are we a company that focuses on quality of care for our patients? But, you know, I believe, Hassan, that these two metrics are intertwined. And so from a regulatory and compliance perspective, how would you define quality of care? So from a, I think it's important to bring up what it means clinically right? Clinically, quality mm -hmm. of care is the degree to which services, healthcare services for individuals and populations lead to better healthcare outcomes. Well, compliance right. perspective, what I believe it means is to which degree the rules and policies that are being put in place help sustain those positive healthcare outcomes. And so to me, it comes into three buckets. One is accountability to the provider. The second is a payer system that um, one continues to make healthcare accessible and affordable, which is a constant challenge uh, within the US. And the third bucket to me is ongoing enforcement and justification of, you know, uh, whether it's audits or other ones. So sure. that to me is the regulatory perspective of quality of care. In your opinion, 
what are the key indicators we should be looking for when assessing the quality of care in a healthcare facility, be it a long-term care facility, assisted living, or even home care? Well, you know, that, that last piece, a little caveat, because home care is so much on the rise right now, mobile care is mm-hmm. so much on the rise right now. Um, when we look at traditional healthcare facilities, obviously one of the ones that you're going to look at is morbidity rates, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, what, what are they looking at each one of these facilities? Um, what is the return rate of patients for the same type of incident or illness in, in situations where there are no chronic illnesses at, at hand? Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, if individuals are consistently coming back for the same level of care, for the same level of service, uh, for something that likely should have been treated at the onset without yeah. the necessity to have prolonged post-acute care tra- trajectories, those are the metrics you really want to look at. Um, and I think what's really important is from an assisted living perspective, it's a very difficult space to to assess from a regulatory perspective. Well, and that's kind of not to interject, but I was going to ask, like, how do you regulate an assisted living facility? Because there's no government funds that because the way the language, first off, you're speaking my language. And I didn't mean to interrupt mid question, but I just had to tell you, I totally like resonate with everything that you're saying and I follow it and I understand it. But assisted living lives outside of the traditional long-term care space, even though it is considered long-term care. So I am fascinated with what, with how you would regulate that type of entity. And, and there's so many facts to this, right? There's a political factor. You right. know, the administration that's currently in place is always going to play a factor into that. Uh, the way the House and the Senate are moving legislatively is going to play a factor into that, mm-hmm. um, which is another conversation because the politics of healthcare <laughs> within the U.S. is another... You know, another mountain to climb, but I think yes. in this living, it's so difficult because unfortunately, the amount of people who need healthcare services in a traditional mm-hmm. or non-traditional setting far outweighs the number of resources that the government and payers have to oversee them. Uh, we are we are in a even in 2023, even with the advancement of technology that we have, we are still very much in a pay and chase system, meaning we are paying on claims and hoping that we have enough data metrics or AI or smart data in place to tell us, hey, these six months of claims for this provider 18 months ago probably shouldn't have been paid. And by now that guy's probably in Barbados or, you know, <laughs> or <laughs> world, you're, you're chasing him. And yeah. so um, it, it's, it's going to continue, I think, to be difficult to that. And this post-COVID enforcement world is a whole, whole other space that's really going to, I think, change the trajectory um, ultimately, I think it leads to, uh, for specifically when it comes to home care and assisted living, that state agencies are going to have an increased responsibility. And unless that comes with an increase in federal funding to support those agencies, yes, continue to have the struggle. And physicians who are in it for the wrong reasons or private equity that's coming into the space for the wrong reasons will continue to benefit from the lack of enforcement. As a regulatory and government compliance professional, what are the most important regulations our listeners should be aware of when evaluating long-term care options? It's a great question. I think first and foremost, we have to recognize some of the more recent legislative changes, which is like the No Surprises Billing Act, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So we need to look there and understand that now healthcare entities are required to show you what healthcare is going to cost you. Um, and that should be one of the most, you know, the, the first and foremost thing you should be seeing when choosing a provider. Um, a, the the other laws that need to be understood by provider or by patients is when it comes to uh, the transparency and billing requirements, whether it's the False Claims Act or otherwise, is that when you get an EOB, an explanation of benefits, yes. you should be looking at those. Um, most people don't, I'll be honest with you. I know I've gotten them and usually they end up in the trash or, um, most people don't understand them. Um, and your explanation of benefits is what tells you as a patient, Hey, this is who you've seen. This is the service that was billed. And so if you see something there that you believe you didn't receive, call your health plan, you should be talking to them. Um, and then, you know, that's the flip side of this conversation is that our health plans equipped to be able to provide that level of service and knowledge 
Um, and so I think those two things are really probably at the precipice of what consumers or patients should be aware of when, you know, entering into any healthcare relationship. Why does it have to be so complicated? Why does the EOB have to literally be like, you know, a Latin written text? Man, it's a million dollar question. <laughs> well, um, no, it's interesting. At the, at the top, I mentioned that I, I recently, you know, did some work uh, a little over a year with a startup. And it was completely focused on being a patient-first, technology-based, you know, company. Sure. Uh, and we're seeing this trend, right? It's we want to make it fast, we want to make it easy, we want people to see it. The the difficulty is your average in person doesn't understand CPT codes. You know, right. they see this mix of numerology and numbers, and 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 then the medical language that's in there. It's like E and M visit for the you know, and then. They're, they went in there and they're like, dude, I had a cold and I just wanted to go in to get a right. checkup. Um, you know, I, I think it's a mix. One is payer requirements force physicians to be very copious in their notes and documentation right. to which they provided service. So I think that's the one piece. The other piece of it is in order for government payers to pay on these claims, they then need to see an equivalent sufficient line of documentation coming. But by the time it reaches the patient, they're so far out of the loop or don't understand the communication. And so I think the the conversation needs to be pivoted from why is is so complicated coming from them to why are physicians not making healthcare more personable to their patients? Um, and I think when, when we begin to focus on the people involved, mm -hmm. then we turn quality of care to not only being a measurable outcome of somebody's health, but also a measurable outcome of somebody's knowledge of their health care. That's impressive. And it ties in to the next question. When we're talking about kind of the, the compliance metrics taking away from the quality of care. So I want to talk about Medicare and Medicaid regulations, because Obviously, a majority of people in the United States receive their long-term care from Medicaid. And as we become more of an aging population, uh, more individuals are participating in Medicare, which has another set of regulations. So arguably, yep. they're some of the most complicated and far-reaching in the care industry. At the end of the day, do you believe that these regulations truly protect patients and ensure they actually receive high-quality care? I think they're very much intended okay. to do that. It doesn't, it doesn't always lead to it. Um, and it's going to be very interesting to see what happens between now and 2030, because by 2030, CMS is planning to you know, phase out itself from the payer system. And I think in order to do that, there are a couple of things that need to happen. First, CMS needs to very clearly articulate a vision and landscape for yes. value-based care yes. so that we can move away from a fee-for-service right. type schedule. Uh, the, the second piece is that um, CMS has to accelerate the incentives for providers who are providing value-based care. Um, unfortunately, what has happened in the Medicare space specifically is there are more providers who are willing to move towards a capitation payment system than a fee-for-service system because ultimately they're still right. making the same amount of and money. And not hold to any higher standard. Uh, and, and it, exactly. And I think the last thing is that health equity has to be a central feature to the value-based system. And what I mean by that is CMS has to play a critical role in the legislative buildup of how commercial payers are more accessible, unfortunately, the, the higher end ones, to people with more money. That's the reality of it. I mean, you even see it when you get a new job and you're offered a health plan, you see that some the employers who use more than one payer, you see there's a package A that's $70 yes. a month for a family and a package C, which is you know usually your Blue Cross Blue Shields that gives you all the bells and whistles, but it's yep. $2,700 a month for a family. And until that gap closes, health, quality of care, healthcare outcomes will continue to be as disparaged as the gap of health equity and accesses. 
I'm going to go down a rabbit hole uh, and stop me if it gets too complicated or technical. I don't think you're going to have a problem with it, but I am curious. You can quantify compliance. Like, you know, you get, so for, I work with managed care, so I understand how health plans and how they integrate with the overall Medicaid system. So I know when they say, we want to see X, Y, and Z, you do X, Y, and Z. Value-based care, though, is a, it's somewhat subjective because I don't know how you can quantify with specific outcomes and metrics the overall health of a human being. And that is, and, and I'm fascinated to hear what you think about that. Like, how do you actually quantify, is it, is it hospital visits? Is it um, the amount of medications that one, person's ta- that one person takes? Um, is it the amount of falls that one person may sustain within a period of time? How would you quantify value-based care? So right now, value-based care is looking at essentially two, uh, essentially two factors, or I, th- or I would think so, is that efficiency and effectiveness, yes. right? Now, when you look at efficiency, physicians look at this as how quickly can I see someone, right? right? Yes. In and out, we're going to have the same 15-minute spiel with every single patient. But then that leads to things like in the billing world, what they call impossible days, because then mm-hmm. they're seeing 70 patients in an eight-hour <laughs> time frame. Yeah. And then effectiveness, the measurement of it is what? Is it the amount of encounters that are being built? Is it the linkage to a specific prescription? So for me, value-based care has to be metriced around the ability for physicians and healthcare entities to provide care that leads to less consequential healthcare services after that initial visit. And again, this is all going to be dependent on the type of service that the person is being sure. visited. For. But I think one of the, 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 the difficulties you have in any of these healthcare models is we are still looking for a healthcare model that incentivizes whom? The physician. Right. And, that's, and that to me is the challenge. Is, yeah, I'll give you a, a brief example, not to sidetrack oh, too much. I recently had a physician client in a, in a consultation or an intake um, who during COVID made an, an egregious amount of money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and, and he said the one thing that every physician client I've almost had, I've always, almost always said, which is everybody's doing it this way. Mm-hmm. And then I thought about that statement after 10 years in healthcare and I said, is everybody doing it this way because everyone's greedy or everyone's just naturally fraudulent, or is it doing it this way because the system incentivizes it Correct. to be this way? Correct. And so when it does, yes, I'm not saying there aren't bad players in the physician game. There are, we know that. There are in the legal field and every yeah. field. But many of them, many of them start out following the model that was right. provided to them. And it is hard to ascertain, you know, or, or to differentiate whether or not, from a fraud perspective, if they truly had intent and knowledge to deceive the payer sure. system. And so when we relate this to quality of care, we really need to be thinking about who are we truly incentivizing from value-based models? Yes. Is va- are, are following value-based models incentivizing healthcare entities or are following value-based models ultimately incentivizing people the, who need these services. Because we know this as well, unfortunately, America is ranked 11 in quality of care in all first world mm-hmm. countries. However, we're ranked number two in the cost of healthcare. What's number one? Those disparities. Who's what's number that? one? You know, that's a good yeah. question. I don't know. Uh, I, I would have to go okay. back and check. Anyway, sorry, those disparities um, you were saying. You know, it's just that that disparity tells yeah. you a lot is that if the cost of healthcare to the person continues to be on the rise, but health equity, meaning the access to quality healthcare continues to drop, the gap continues, are, are we really creating payer systems that incentivize better quality of care? Are we creating better healthcare systems that simply incentivize physicians and healthcare entities? Uh, we have this discussion to nausea uh, within our organization. And like 
for me, maybe call me call me a, a, a rogue player or call me somebody that's unorthodox, but I've just never really put a lot of um, credence on documentation. I know that's like the cardinal sin of all healthcare. Um, but in terms of like my capacity for, for billing and claims and things like that, yes, there's a long list of, of processes and checks and balances to make sure that we're properly billing. But in terms of like daily documentation, in terms of what I want my staff to be doing, yeah. um, our staff to be doing, documentation is not at the top of the list. But, but the reason that I say that is because there are a lot of companies that documentation is the number one thing on their list. So people provide care second, but they document first. So it's such a so so just an interesting story I could share. Recently, we are retained to uh, represent a physician in mm -hmm. a fair hearing where he was going to have his clinical privileges terminated after mm -hmm. a decade at this entity because his discharge summary documentation okay. was under par for a certain period of time, right? Now, let me, let me equate this for you. The guy was there for over a decade. Mm -hmm. He had served in leadership capacity. He had led certain initiatives within the hospital to help promote better healthcare outcomes, patient access, right? When we got in there and I first read this initial complaint, my first thought was, where, show me where the patient harm is because my right. thought was, no discharge summary leads to the seceding physician to not have adequate notes to provide care. Right. There was not a single instance of when any record of his discharge summary was, mind you, what they were hitting him on is he had to get it done within 48 hours. There were some days he got it done in three or four. Sure, sure. That's different. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But there was not a single iota of evidence brought forward that this led to patient harm or anything else. So what does that tell you? I'll tell you what it told me. What it told me is that this healthcare entity is likely incentivized. Right. But this division of the hospital is likely incentivized by their ability to meet this compliance metric of X percentage of discharge summaries being done within a certain period of time. But where does that get driven from? It gets driven from the fact that the payer system is so focused on the minutia of documentation in areas where it is not related to patient care, but it's getting done. So therefore you got to pay on it and therefore we got to make sure we're doing it. And there's so much resources and time putting into that, that the patient themselves is the one dealing with the consequences. And, and Hassan, to take it once, even one step further... I would say that they probably need that discharge summary almost acting as an authorization to bill for any type of remaining services. Guaranteed. And and then So there's a financial know, incentive as well. Absolutely. And you think about too, like the consequences then physicians have to deal yeah. with. Like I, I, I the 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 first half of our conversation may make me sound like I'm non empathetic to them, but I am because it's stressful. Yeah. I mean, my, my wife is a PA, right? Oh wow. And okay. I her coming home from shifts during COVID and she was more stressed about what she did or didn't write down than dealing with the, she's an ICU PA, dealing with the people who are dying in right. front of her. or or more worried about that than bringing home yes. COVID to me and my daughters. <laughs> uh, and, it, and it really does make you think is like, you know, physicians are put under an enormous amount of stress because even if they wanted to focus, to your point, on providing care first, their business aspect, the economics of their yes. practice may take it, a hit. It puts their job at risk. Yeah, their, yeah. their whole career. Yeah. We're talking about a guy who was there for a decade, you know, yeah. I just told you about. And now potentially losing his mm -hmm. license, potentially being out of work for a year. It's, it's crazy yeah. to me. As someone that works in compliance... 
Do you have any advice for how to advocate for our loved ones receiving care? And what rights do we have? And how can we ensure that these rights are upheld? Yeah, so advocating for our loved ones for care. I think the most important thing is, you know, and I'm going to take this from the perspective of coming from a minority community. So I live in the city of Dearborn, Michigan. Dearborn, Michigan is home to a majority of an Arab American population, many of whom are first generation, um, like myself, who had parents who came here long, long ago, never spoke the language. Uh, My dad came here in 51. You know, he worked on the assembly line of Chrysler and and that was our upbringing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think the first thing is, is we truly have to understand that Healthcare, their healthcare relationship is a two-way street. And then what I mean by that is, unfortunately, it is not built right now to where they are thinking about things like communication with the patient first. Um, and so you have to really build relationships with your physician and healthcare community. Um, the rules and laws that are available to you is like, one, you should be able to always access any type of request or need you have around medical records. Um, There should be no impediments to that. Uh, The other piece is understanding that um, who to go to if you have issues. If it's not someone at your uh, local state agency, understanding who to call, like here it would be the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Mm -hmm. understanding, you know, those avenues. But more importantly is your payer is having an understanding who to contact at your payer system, whether it's for an appeal, a grievance, um, uh, if that situation may arise. Um, and and I, I do want to tailor this to those in the minority communities, is that for those of you listening who may be in a minority community that are English speaking first, like myself, be the advocate of change and hope for those who are not. Um, you, you It really does take a very intentional effort uh, by those of us who are relied on um, within those communities so that we can provide additional services, whether it's simply translating something for somebody or being the reason why people you know, have more knowledge and resources. That's something we do as a consulting group quite a bit of is we try to offer as many free resources to um, people in our mm-hmm. community, people we have no expectation of ever being clients simply because We all play a role in better healthcare outcomes within this country, whether we're providers or we're not. And as compliance professionals, that means continuously finding ways to make information accessible and easy to understand. You and I have a very, I have a feeling that we live a very similar life, at least professionally, uh, in terms of trying to help people um, that don't understand the healthcare system because, you know, you and I can talk about this all day long, understand what each, which, what each other are saying. We understand all the abbreviations. We understand, you know, all the different terms that come up. Um, but there's a lot of people that look at an explanation of benefits, like we were saying earlier, and like, what is this? And I think it's naturally complicated because there are, the, the system doesn't just say, okay, you know, this is John. John's 65 years old. John suffers from these types of, of medical illnesses or over the course of his history. And it's probably going to cost us $75,000 to make sure that John has its basic needs met every year for the next 15 years. They don't budget like that. They say, okay, here's John and you bill for every service that you provide to John and we'll pay you and then we'll do and then make sure your documentation is in line or we'll recoup your money. We'll charge you back. And so these benefits, these explanations have so many uh, billing codes and terminology that's foreign to most people. And so the fact that you spend the time helping your community and just helping people in general, being able to navigate this, I think that that's one of the driving forces to change. I think that the, you, tell, you tell 10 people, the next time you know, they have a friend that reaches out to them, they at least have some general understanding of what you told them. And I think as more people understand that this system doesn't have to be this complicated. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you like a very normal occurrence for me on any given day, any given week. Um, 
first it's, it starts with my mom. My, my mom is English was her second yeah. language. Um, still is. She's been here 45 years, primarily speaks the Arabic mm -hmm. language. It wasn't until maybe just over a decade ago that language access requirement laws started requiring these entities to actually translate these documents into a right. language where 5% or more of their population right. speaks. I mean, that's, that's crazy. Know. <laughs> you, you, you know, it, it's, it's wild. And, and so then it, this really means is like they're getting a paper. They have no idea where it's coming from, what it means. But here's, here's, I think, the residual impact of this, right? Is it causes nervousness. It causes this kind of low-grade fear mm -hmm. that every single time I go to see a doctor, something is coming to me that I don't understand. I don't know what it means. It has I numbers on there. I don't, I don't know if I have to pay it. I didn't expect it. I thought I was Medicaid eligible. I thought this was covered. So now what does this mean? So what does that lead to is then people become hesitant to go yeah. get care. And I'll tell you, my mom is a traditional Southern Lebanese woman. She's as old school as they come. She still believes that Verner's and soup are the best remedy to yeah. any illness, um, which she has a good argument for. But point being is that in minority communities, this is what it yeah. has led to is that they you know, when you talk about the discussion of quality care, you also have to think about what does that mean to different people in Good different point. populations? Because quality of care to an affluent or to mid-income level people who do speak the language means, okay, am I in good health? Are they providing me service that leads to better health? To other people, that may mean as simple as something as, can I yeah. make an appointment? Well, having to call a family member to come provide translation yeah. no, services yeah, that's, for me. A, that's a fantastic an analogy. And like we were talking about in terms of health equity, I think it's very important. So let's move on. What do you believe is the future of healthcare compliance and regulations? And how will this impact the quality of care, especially for the senior care sector? Oh, that's a, that's a excellent question, especially in specifying that sector. Um, so future of government uh, healthcare compliance, I think you, you have to look at trends. Healthcare compliance consistently has been evolving. Um, and I talked about us continuing to be in a pay and chase system, mm -hmm. but I do think that AI is going to play a considerable role in the data mining of living claims. And the ability for AI and other data-centric platforms or softwares to identify claims on the prepay side is going to play a significant role in healthcare being less costly. Because if you can stop claims from leaving the door before you pay them and then make sure that there are certain compliance requirements being met, it drives down the cost for the payer. It drives down the cost for the government, which naturally drives down cost of healthcare mm -hmm. overall. From an auditing perspective, I think that CMS pushing back from its role between now and 2030 is going to lead to a very specific state-by-state -state agenda that is going to be specifically tailored for that state's populations, yeah. which, then, which then leads to the implications of political elections, because we all know that healthcare is a really sexy sell during campaign yeah. season. Um, and because of that, you know, a lot of legislative advocacy or promises and otherwise are made. Um, and so then as it pertains specifically to the senior care centers is um, one most, most I would say, I, I statistically can't reference this, but in, from what I've seen is more and more seniors are leaning towards specialty care facilities or right. home care Include, I'll tell you, my mother included, for their type of care. And so depending on how the government reacts to the governance of home care-related services is going to be a really telling um, a metric. If it's anything like has happened in the past, meaning when new health care services have come up, whether it's mobile care, wound care, laboratory care, it usually leads to a new agency being created the agency having a derivative authority from the Department of Justice or the OIG, some type of relation in there, and then combining that relationship with delegating authority to health plans, 
and state agencies to maintain compliance. Fascinating. I mean, I'm just fascinating. I could sit here and talk literally hours about this, but I, I know that it's going to, this is going to serve a, a wide range of people. Um, and I think it's really giving people uh, an opening kind of opening the door um, to better understand how our industry works, how our system works, even though on a, on somewhat of a technical level, but it's a necessary technical level. Because I think you and I have both established in this episode that it's because of the complicated nature and because it kind of happens behind the scenes, somewhat in the shadows even, in terms of, you know, billing departments being in the basement, p- punching in claims all day long, you know, on, on uh, UBO4 forms. It's because of the nature of the business that most consumers are like, yeah, I'm not, I don't know anything about it. I don't know how it works. I don't know how much I'm going to pay. I just like, I walk in, I get sick, I get question marks. And honestly, they're probably more anxious and ha- suffer even worse health outcomes because of the anxiety. Um, and not to mention, obviously, the equity part of it, where people from different social economic, socioeconomic groups probably suffer even higher levels. So... So we always like to end the show with a call to action. What are some actionable steps we can take today to ensure we're choosing the best long-term care options for ourselves or a parent? Uh, I I highlighted this a little bit briefly um, before, but you should have a relationship with with your primary care physician. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is, Choosing a physician who is accessible, um, if you have a language restriction, a physician whose office can support you by him, him or herself or their staff uh, to, to with those language access requirements. I think that's such a key piece with the growing diverse uh, communities that we are building here uh, across the United States. Um, and I think more than, than all of that is understand what your health care plan provides you. Um, on, this is, it, it, you You know, as much as we want to try to challenge the system, we also have to understand the system. Mm-hmm. What I mean by that is, you brought it up, is that some people, before they get care, they think, man, if I, get, if I take an ambulance ride right now, that's 800 bucks yeah. that I don't have. Right. So let me, let me think twice about that. So understanding the system is very important too, because... Um, and, and reaching out to individuals like yourself, like our group, um, uh, and and I think even you know the true call to action here, Costa, is to people like you and me, as people that are in the positions of knowledge, our knowledge is power. Yes. And so when you have the knowledge, you have to use that knowledge to benefit those that we know otherwise wouldn't be able to. At least that's what I feel is a part of our obligation in this profession. And so I think continue to find ways to serve those communities and, you know, continue fighting the good fight. We got to take little, little chips at it, uh, you know, much like how it probably was with you in the, in the, in the hockey rink is, you know, when that fight comes, <laughs> drop the gloves and take it head on. And, 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 you know, sooner or later, hopefully we'll continue to create better health systems. 